Yo. Uh, I think we're ready for number four of the undercover narcotics detective episodes, series, whatever you want to call it. Um, for those of you who haven't seen one, two, and three, you probably will have to kind of catch up, maybe go back and watch those. Um, you know, everything happens for a reason. I think we all kind of believe that. And actually right now, we all need to start taking care of each other, which I've mentioned before. Um, the world's kind of a mess. But back to the story. Getting into an outlaw biker club when you're a cop is not easy. It's only been done a few times. I would just say that if any one of the links in this chain of events that happened had broke or one of those links hadn't been there, I would have never been able to pull this off. So I felt like it was meant to be. I felt like this was my calling and that's what I was going to do. I was going to get in with this club. So to the story, I'm scrambling. These guys are on their way, I'm assuming. And I've got to convince them that I've got all the money in the world, that I can come up with hundreds of thousands of dollars. And they're going to produce as many pounds of cocaine, tens of pounds, even more, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of cocaine, high quality cocaine. That's already been confirmed. <clears throat> and they're on their way. They want to do a face to face meeting. They're from, flying in from California. So I've got to scramble and come up with something. My first thought was, okay, I got to impress them with a nice car. Um, maybe I need a Mercedes. Maybe I go borrow uh, Ralph's Mercedes. That's the beginning of one of these episodes. <clears throat> no, that wouldn't be a good idea. Um, better not do that. So I call the uh, local Mercedes dealership and um, took a while, but I finally got the owner of the dealership on the phone explained who I was and that I wanted to rent a car. And it was a major deal for the city, a major drug deal. He invited me to come right over to the dealership. I told him there was a time factor involved. So I get to the dealership and uh, I'm escorted up to his office. He closes the door, beautiful plush office. You can imagine a Mercedes dealership and he's the owner of the dealership. So I tell him a quick story. I've got these guys flying in. I really don't know who they are, but they've kind of proven to me that they, they've, got, they've got the goods if I can come up with the money. And I thought if I could rent a nice Mercedes that that would kind of help with my image that I could produce all this money. And the guy thought for a second and he goes, you know what? I lost a daughter to cocaine. How about... You know, getting in the car is no problem. Yeah, you've got the car. Would it help if you were part owner in the dealership? And right then my mind's cranking away. I'm like, oh, wow, where's he going with this? And he says, why don't I, um, why don't I help you out with this? I would do anything I can to fight drugs. He says, why don't I, um, why don't I give you the keys? And, um, you could bring these fellows here and kind of impress them that you're uh, my son-in-law or something. And I'm like, wow, cool. This guy's, you know, it's a dream come true for a narc. So he gives me the keys to the uh, showroom and he gives me the personal keys, you know, to his office. He says, I'll tell the janitor. He says, don't come in till late at night. He says, and I'll tell the janitor. If uh, some guys come in here and unlock the door and come into the showroom, you're to leave. The janitor is to leave. And he says, and you bring those guys up to my office and you close this door. And um, he kind of looks around the office and says, this should impress him. And I said, you know what? Maybe if I had um, a picture of like my wedding picture up on one of your shelves there. That would help. And he goes, that's a good idea. Do whatever you want. So anyway, I said, well, he says, it's going to take me a few minutes to get the car ready. And I said, okay, well, I'm going to run home and I'm going to get 
my wedding picture and that way I can set it up on your shelf there and that might help, you know, fill some gaps when I talk to these guys. It's a good idea. So I run home, which wasn't too far away, and I grab a picture uh, of my wedding. And so, in fact, that's right there uh, behind me right now. And I put that up on um, in, in his office on his shelf so that when I brought these guys in, I could go, oh, yeah, this is my, my, my father-in-law owns this place kind of thing. And they could obviously see that's me in the picture. So this was amazing. So I get back. I, um, I get the picture up to his office. He's taking care of everything. He walks me outside, and I'm expecting to get, you know, a Mercedes off of the used car lot. You know, still a nice car, but he takes me over to a brand new, top of the line, um, luxury Mercedes. Still has the stickers in the window. And I said, "You want me to drive this?" He goes, "Yeah. If you were part owner of the business, you wouldn't be running around in something else. You'd be driving a new car because you got to promote the business." I'm like, okay, works for me. So I've got this brand new Mercedes with like 20 miles on it or something. Black. Um, so that's that. DEA has confirmed they're on their way. Um, my unit has set up uh, two rooms at the hotel near the, the airport and their adjoining rooms and they've set up their equipment and they've, um, they've got the microphones set up, all the wires set up in the room that I'm going to be in with these guys and they're going to monitor and record everything in the next room and then, of course there's a safety issue, you always have to have cover. So everything's set, uh, it's just a matter of they going to show up. Um, so I'm still scrambling, like, I don't know how this is going to go and how I'm going to keep my story going. And, you know, I don't know how pushy they're going to be because they were kind of, kind of rude on the phone. So anyway, I get to the airport at the appointed time and I'm waiting and sure enough, there was no doubt who the biker trash was that was getting off of that plane. And that's what they told me. They said, you'll know us, we'll be the biker trash. There was no doubt. I don't think they got any congeniality wards while they were on the plane. Uh, everybody was kind of steering clear of them. As soon as they come through that little hallway, people just scattered from these two guys. They were some rough looking characters. So I went up, introduced myself. Everything's cool. So remember I, I've talked about staying in control. You always try to control every situation, when you, especially when you're working undercover. And um, so as we leave, I had parked the Mercedes right outside the main exit that we were going to come out of. They didn't have but one little carry-on bag. They didn't have any luggage. So uh, we walk out and they just start kind of strolling. One guy lights up a cigarette and I kind of direct them to the Mercedes and they're like, whoa, cool. All right. You know, so already I'm starting to take a little bit of control. It's like, oh, he does have the money. Man, this is a hundred thousand dollar car at least. So, um, we're getting in, I go to the driver's side, they go to the passenger side, and one guy has a cigarette, and I go, whoa, 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 you can't, you can't smoke that cigarette in the car. This is a brand new car, I gotta sell this thing. Oh, oh, yeah. And his toughness, his, his bravado came down several notches, and I was able to get just a little bit of control. And he put his, you know, tossed his cigarette out. And um, that was a big step. I took a little bit of control of, of one of them, and he was the bigger of the two. He was the big, mean-looking dude. The other guy was fairly small, but he had that look on his face that he knew what he was doing. I still don't know who they are. DEA hasn't been able to identify them by the names that they gave. So, try to make this as short as I can. Uh, I take them directly to the room, and they're impressed with the car. Uh, they're touching all the leather and everything, and... Um, it's, you know, I park it so nobody puts any door dings in it. And we walk into the hotel and I go directly to the room. I had already prepared the room or my guys helped me do this. We filled the sink full of ice and, and canned beers. Um, you know, lower end beers. The bikers don't drink, um, you know, fancy uh, foo-foo beers. Um, I like them myself, but anyway, we, uh, we had just, you know, some, some cheaper beers. And there's a nice refrigerator in the room, but that's just not biker style. So I had the sink full of ice and all these beers in there. So 
they went right to the beers, popping beers, and we start talking. And they immediately, um, the smaller of the two who was in control, uh, immediately started talking about the drug deal. And I'm like, oh, no, sh sh let's, don't, let's don't talk here. We'll go to my business after a while when it closes and we'll, we'll talk. And they didn't know what my business was yet. So uh, they're like, oh, okay, cool. You know. And uh, so I think I ordered some pizza. We had that delivered and they inhaled that. And uh, like all bikers, they wanted to go to a tea bar. I won't say the word, uh, but it's a, you know, a strip club, but they have a different term for it. So they want to go to the tea bar. And I'm like, okay, that's, that's fine. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of familiar with those. So if you think back on Kirk, the bouncer from the first strip club with uh, Ralph, um, I give, uh, I give the club a call to see if Kirk's there, because I'll, I'll, I'll take him there, you know. And uh, he's not working. I'm like, oh, crap, you know, this would have been great. And whoever I had on the phone said, but he's working at this other club tonight. He's bouncing at another club tonight. This is a big bouncer, biker bouncer, biker club associate for the new ones here. Um, and they gave me the number. So, bingo, I dialed this other club, which is actually closer to where we are. It's on the south end of town near Fort Carson, which is a big army base in Colorado Springs. So I call and uh, I demand to get uh, Kirk on the phone. First, I don't want to, whoever answered the phone didn't have time to mess with me. And I said, tell him it's so-and-so. And I gave him my undercover name. And uh, within a few minutes, he's on the phone. What's up, bud? And I said, hey. I got these dudes in from out of town. I brought them in from California. I want to bring them to your club. I need you to take care of them. There's no problem, man. I got you. I got you covered. So things are coming together. So I tell the guys, okay, we're going to go off to the club. I've got, um, I, I know some people there. And he goes, well, it better be good. There better be some hot chicks there and, you know, the normal macho stuff. So we're preparing to leave. And my plan is we'll go to the club for a while. I'll entertain these guys and uh, let them have a few drinks. And then I'll take them to the Mercedes dealership and we'll, we'll get on with the negotiations. But I didn't want to let them know about the dealership yet. So we uh, are about ready to go. I've still got a beer and I'm sitting down in a chair and I'm knocking off the end of this beer. And the smaller of the two comes over and he gets in my face and just kind of stares at me for a second. And he goes, I hope you know who you're messing with. And it was a little bit intimidating. I mean, he was smaller than I was. And, you know, I lived this world, you know, I'm, I'm not usually intimidated by people. But things changed real quick. He stood up, turned around with his back to me, pulled up his T-shirt, and lean back into me, and on the back of his, covering his full back, were the colors of the biggest, baddest biker club in the world. And on the rocker on the bottom, it was tattooed Nomad, which means he goes anywhere in the world for the club and takes care of business. And he turns around, he goes, now you know who you're blankety blanking with. And if you're a blankety-blank cop, you're dead. Now, I have to admit, right then, my heart rate did go up just a little bit. So, I try to act um, as tough as I can. Like, hey, whatever, man. We're just doing business. So that's, that's where I'm going to wrap this one up because... Um, we go to the club, and that's really interesting. Uh, really interesting. Uh, Kirk takes good care of us, I guarantee you that. Um, but quite a few things happened at the club, and I realized, I, I knew how powerful this club was and the influence they had. And I knew who our local club was, and they're, they're some pretty bad boys too. But I had no idea just how powerful these guys are but I found out at the club. So, 
I hope uh, this is working for you. Uh, I got these bad boys getting ready to take them out partying. And there's going to be some drinking and some girls. And wow, I'm, um, I'm not really nervous, but I'm going to be on my toes tonight. So give me a like if you like this story. Uh, four of these stories so far. I'm going to try to wrap it up. I was actually going to try to finish this one in this video, but so much happens at the club and then later on that it's going to take another video to do that. So I hope you're staying with me. I really appreciate the comments. I appreciate the, the views. Uh, please uh, subscribe to my channel. Uh, I got a lot more stuff, a lot more stories to tell. Uh, get through this first one. And then um, uh, share it with everybody. And uh, of course, check out my book, House Secrets. It's on Amazon. It talks about well, the main character kind of based on, on my life so please check that out um, and uh, let's take care of one another and i'll see you on the next video real soon thanks for watching <laughs>